Good morning. Stand to your feet if you would, please. <clears throat> Our Father, you're righteous and you're perfect in every way. And you're holy and you're good and you're merciful. And your love is forever. And your grace is forever. And it's so broad and wide and deep and, and high that we can't comprehend the beginning or the end of it. But you just envelop us in your love and grace and mercy. And we thank you for this. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are the Creator God who gives us this day, Heavenly Father, to bring honor to your name. Thank you, mighty and righteous Father, that you are, are always in control. And thank you, Heavenly Father, that even in this moment, the Lord Jesus maintains this world and this earth. And thank you, Father, that you give us hot days and you give us cool days and you give us moderate days in temperature to remind us Heavenly Father of, of your love and how your love uh, moves about us Father I pray that this day this morning this hour that you would speak to your church and I pray Heavenly Father that you would encourage your church and I pray, Heavenly Father, that you, would, that you would exalt Jesus Christ in this church. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would minister to needs of the hurting, of the desperate in this church. And I pray through all of this, Heavenly Father, that you receive all glory through Jesus Christ. We ask these things in his great name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Morning. You know what I just thought about? <laughs> His son. Who, who was that laughing? <laughs> that, that, was, that was it yeah, that I thought about it. I thought just this very second, God is good. Oh. We had 180 in Bible study this morning. We had three guests. And also I was reminded this morning, and I just about forgot it because Morgan didn't remind me to put it in the evangel this week, but someone reminded me this morning that today is National Grandparents Day. And I well know that because I went to a two-year-old uh, birthday party Thursday after four hours of confusion, I mean infusion. But uh, this is National Grandparents Day, so in honor of grandparents, uh, I know you just stood, but would you please, if you're a grandparent, would you please stand? No, I was really pointing at uh, Yancy's mom, because he said this is her first time to be a grandparent. Where's the uh, grandchild? Let's give our grandparents a hand. Thank you. And also, you noticed in your bulletin this morning, there was a flyer about last chance of courage. Uh, uh, last ounce. Last ounce of courage. <laughs> I, I had too much confusion the other day. But uh, if you watched the Huckabee show uh, last night, you saw Chuck Norris, who introduced, uh, is supporting this, and also uh, the man that's the main character in it. And so it was promoted last night. But you will not want to miss this movie, a pre, uh, Last Ounce of Courage, that premieres in Hattiesburg September the 11th and will be in theaters nationwide on September the 14th. And also the movie 2016 is presently being shown, and you need to see that too. Uh, I'd like to remind you that this Wednesday night will be business meeting, covered dish, and so please keep that in mind. Our senior adults will be going back to school this Thursday. We're going to have a back to school days, and we're going to have a goonerism about Brenda Seller. And so you senior adults, make your plans to be with us this coming Thursday at 1130. Also, if you would like to have a group meeting, a small group meeting in your home on the Sunday night, September the 30th at 6 p.m., please let the office know about it this week, and we appreciate that very much. If you're a guest this morning, we'd like to again welcome you and say that we're so pleased that you're in God's house this morning. And if you're looking for a church home, we enlighten. 
and invite you to let our church be your church. The psalmist David said, I was glad when you said unto me, let us go unto the house of the Lord. And we're glad you're here this morning. And so if you're a guest, would you please remain seated and receive one of these orders of bulletin, worship service, and there's a place for you to on this flap to fill out the information. And if you would, just leave it in the pew. And if you're a church member, if you have a special need, like a prayer request, you likewise fill that out and leave it on the pew. So if you're a guest, remain seated and receive one of these worship bulletins. And church members, let's stand and greet one another. Oh, my soul longeth. 
I speak to you this morning as a believer, as a member of this church, and as your treasurer. Tuesday morning, as I sat down to write checks, I looked at the bank balance. I looked at, uh, to that point, what had been uh, deposited since that uh, bank balance. I uh, looked at the checks that were outstanding that had not yet cleared the bank. I looked at the checks that I needed to write. After adding all of that up, all said and done, there would have been $100 remaining 100. Rather than write checks then, I went to the Grand Bank, I liquidated our uh, money market account and took it and deposited it into the checking account. All to the point, there is no more rainy day fund. As then I wrote checks and completed them, uh, unfortunately, some other bills came in. Uh, after all was said and done by Wednesday, there was in the bank about $2,900. That is not enough to write this week's payroll checks, plus other bills that have come in. Interestingly enough, I looked at our giving for this year and I found that had we given 20% more than we have that we would be right on target for budget. Uh, I wouldn't be here talking to you this morning about this subject. So in effect we're behind by 20%. There could be other things that happen uh, and we expect them, but uh, that's the case. We needed to have given 20% more. Now, I know in my heart that money did not create this church. Money did not create the congregation of believers in this church, but rather it was God's love, mercy, grace, and the blood of the Lamb. Amen. And that's what created this church. Having said that, however, in reading 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, several times, here's what I find. That giving does encourage others. Giving makes the local church have a presence. It lets 38th be a presence in Hattiesburg. Right. And our giving is the vehicle that transports God's word around this world. Mm -hmm. Those are just three things I got out of that chapter. I would challenge you to read Second Corinthians chapter 9. Read it several times. Let it sink in. <clears throat> right now, I can say to you that I intend to continue to be your treasurer with all my shortfalls and errors and omissions and oversights, but I will t continue to do my best to be your treasurer. Looking at the fifth chapter of Acts, and I want to refer to that to be a little careful about what I'm going to say next. Uh, but I would encourage you to also read the fifth chapter of Acts. But it has to do with my personal commitment. And I have a personal commitment that I am going to commit myself to giving 20% more than I have been giving. That will be on a temporary basis. By temporary, I mean until I don't or until it becomes permanent. And if you read the fifth chapter of Acts, you will see why I want to be very careful there. I do not want to incur the result of Ananias and Sapphira. 
I would ask you now, deacons, join me and pray with me. Father in heaven, first of all, I ask you to forgive me for any misword that I've spoken today. Father, I know that uh, you want us as a church to be useful to you. I know, Father, that you don't need us. But, Father, I also know because of your love, you want to use us. And, Father, giving is one of the ways that you can use us. I pray that if any word that I have misspoke today has touched any heart, I invoke, I pray, I plead for the Holy Spirit to correct that error and to place the truth on each and every heart here. Father, as that young Olympian, Gabrielle Douglas, so aptly said, all glory flows up to you and all blessings flow down from you. God, be with us. Thank you for Jesus. I pray in his precious name. Amen. Amen.
Yes, he is worthy of all of our praise. And I will serve him because I love him.
bid darkness turn to day, wipe sorrow, tears away, nor let me ever stray from thee aside. When ends life's transit dream, when death goes on,
Okay. Well, <laughs> um, Acts chapter 4, if you would please. I'm going to tell you a story before we read. Keep your seat, keep your seat, keep your seat. I'm going to tell you a story before we read it. <coughs> Excuse me. They changed my meds so I wouldn't cough. Um, there's a man in the 20th century named Duncan Campbell. Matt, Nick, you guys need to study Duncan Campbell. You need to go get his biography. Read about him. He went to the Hebrides Islands, which is off of Scotland, and um, in 1949. He had not just gone there for just a week or so. He went there and he stayed there for, for two, three, four years as he went to that place. And um, he went from church to church, from town to town. One of the times that he was there in 49 or perhaps 50, uh, he went to the village of Arnall, and that was a cold place. Y'all ever been to a place that's cold? Y'all ever been inside? You visited some other churches, and it was just cold inside. You know, you could skate down the aisles. Y'all ever been that kind of place before? Well, that's how it was. Everywhere he went, people didn't care. They were aloof. They were reserved. They didn't want to hear the gospel. And so he called for a prayer meeting, and they went to the house of a blacksmith. And they prayed at the house of a blacksmith. Blacksmith was named John. Campbell, at one point during the prayer meeting, said, John, I think the time has come for you to pray. And so the blacksmith prayed, and he took his cap in his hand, and he held on to his cap. And right in the middle of his prayer, he raised his right hand to heaven. And he said, O oh God, you made a promise to pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. And Lord, it's not happening. Now that's kind of bold, don't you think? He paused again and then he continued, Lord, if I know anything about my own heart, I stand before thee as an empty vessel thirsting for thee and for a manifestation of thy power. He stopped again, and after a moment of tense silence, he cried out, O oh God, your honor is at stake, and I now challenge you to fulfill your covenant engagement and do what you have promised to do. In that very moment, the house shook, and the dishes rattled in the cupboard, and wave after wave of God's power swept over the house where they were. And Duncan Campbell remembered at that point, and he told this to the man that wrote the book I got that from, he remembered at that point this passage in Acts chapter 4. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God 
with boldness. Father, this is your word, and I trust you to speak to us through this word today, and I want to give you glory and praise through Jesus Christ in this moment. Amen. Now as we look at this passage of Scripture and we see what we have in front of us and as we think of the story that came from 1949-1950 with Duncan Campbell and what happened in the Hebrides Islands, as we think of this, I want you to think today of ground-shaking prayer. And what is it and how is it that God moves and how God shows himself powerful in this time, but perhaps not in that time. And I've looked this over and I'm going to give you before I'm finished five specific words that I think are components of what we need to have ground-shaking prayer this morning. The first word that I want to give you that describes this ground-shaking prayer is unity. And I want us to see what God's Word says when we talk about unity. In verse 24, <coughs> after Peter and John and the former lame man had come together where the rest were, after they got there and they told their story to this group of people, when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord. You see, unity is one of the priority factors here. In fact, unity must be a priority for us. Turn back a few pages, if you will, to John 17. Let me show you what our Lord Jesus Christ says to us this morning. The Bible says this in John 17, beginning in verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Now, I'm including that verse so you will understand that he's talking about us here. He's not just talking about the disciples themselves and the early church. This includes all of us at this moment. And what does he say? Verse 21. That they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. You see, unity must be a priority because this is one of the priority things that Jesus prayed for just before he was crucified. One of the things that Jesus desires more than anything else is that churches walk in unity. And this priority stands before us today. But why unity? What's the purpose of the unity? It's very clear in the passage when you get in verse 21 and the last part that the world may believe that you sent me. You see, really and truly there are two things that should happen when a church is united. One is evangelism and the other is edification. The world is going to believe that Jesus Christ is Lord when they see unity within the body of Christ. Amen? This is important. It's key for us, ladies and gentlemen. But also, you and I will be built up in one, as we are in one accord, will be edified, will be built up together when we walk in unity. This always happens. And then I want you to understand that in spite of the fact there's a priority and a purpose of unity, there are some pitfalls that we have to avoid. I'm just going to mention them very quickly and I'm not going to dwell on them at all. But I want you to hear me. I'm only giving you a few. There are more than what I'm going to give you. One of the pitfalls is sin in the camp. Because sin, as you know, breaks unity. Remember this, ladies and gentlemen, you and I are the body of Christ. We are the body. And when you, if you have some secret sin in your life, when you 
transgress against God's word and God's principles and you're not living in unity with God when your fellowship is broken with God it does not just affect you you also impact the rest of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ it's just like a person who becomes ill and I know you've done this before you've done it with with some of you men out there working before and you've You've hit your thumb or something with a hammer, and it didn't just hurt your thumb, your whole body reacted to that. Your whole body tensed up in that moment. Your tongue almost says something you don't want it to say, and you spit on the ground and burn a hole about 50 feet deep in the ground when, because you don't want to be saying things you know you ought not to say. But your whole body hurts, doesn't it? Ladies and gentlemen, when one of us Whoever it is, whether it's the pastor, the deacons, the chairman of deacons, the vice chairman of deacons, the treasurer, or a Sunday school teacher, or whoever in the church sins, then ladies and gentlemen, understand it impacts all of the body. It affects all of us, not just some of us. Amen? Never forget that. Sin breaks unity with God. Sin breaks unity with the body. Then there is that that pitfall called unforgiveness where we have relationship problems with one another. And you know, and and that takes place. Uh, uh, Then there is individualism. That Lone Ranger mentality. Oh, we had to fight that. Pam can tell you story after story. We had one man who lived up in one part of Peru, that it didn't matter what the board says, he was going to do it his way. Remember Luke? (laughs) And Luke was a good old fella. Luke was just an interesting fella. You tell him we'll be out about 1 o'clock in the morning and and it'll be all right. I'm going to preach till I finish this thing. Amen. So listen to me, folks. Individualism, unforgiveness, sin in the camp, but there's also insincerity in worship when we're not serious. I want to ask you something. Not just public worship here, but when you have your prayer time, do you have that period sometimes? I I have to raise my hand. Where you just yawn through your prayers. (laughs) You know, you yawn through your worship. Oh, Lord. (sighs) It's a new day. Thanks. Might not gotta get some coffee. And then you wonder why there's no power. Hello? Now y'all the world hasn't ended, so you can get back into this thing a little bit. Some of you got so concerned right now, you're listening, you're thinking, how long is this fellow gonna preach today? All of these things will impact, impact unity. And then there's another one that I want to mention. It's called unbelief. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 3 that when we have an unbelieving heart, it's an evil heart. And unbelief will impact unity. I just don't believe God can do it. Well, I want to tell you something. God can do it and God will do it. Amen? That's our Lord. So unity is important. The next word that describes uh, a ground-shaking prayer is the word humility. We need to humble ourselves before Almighty God. And I want to show you something from the text because this prayer in Acts chapter 4 uses three words to describe God. The first word that's mentioned there in verse 24 is the word Lord, but it's not the normal word for Lord that we would use. It's the word in the Greek that translates as despot. And it's talking about master. And you need to recognize God as your master. You see, the Sanhedrin, the rulers and the elders had power. And they recognized that the rulers and the elders had power. But they said, you, God, have absolute power. You are the absolute ruler this morning, Lord. And this word master is that word right there. Let me ask you something. Is Jesus the absolute ruler of your heart? Is he the master of your heart? When you humble yourself before God, you need to recognize him as the master of your heart. And then the second word that's used there describes the majesty of God 
where he says, Lord, you are God. And that's the word theos in the, in the Greek language. And it, and it speaks to us of the majesty of Almighty God. We sing that wonderful, wonderful praise chorus that came about for the majority of us in the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, this, this chorus, majesty, we worship his majesty. You remember that? I can only, it just the Spanish words come to me anymore. I don't think much of the English words with that. Um, when, I, when I start singing it, I just automatically want to switch over into Spanish with it. And no, I'm not going to do it right now. Then there's the third word that's mentioned there. And he uses the word Lord again. And it's the word kurias. And it's, that's the general word that's used. But that speaks about God as maker. It says, Lord, you see all of these things, and you see the people that's come together, but you, Lord, you're in control. You're the creator of all of these things. You're the maker of all of these things. And those three words always point to the fact that, number one, it's not about the problem. Number two, it's not about the people. It's about God Himself. And it's always about God. And you see what's going on with us and what we're facing right now and what we're listening to right now. It's not about us. It's about God's character and God's glory. Amen? You need to remember that, church. Don't ever forget that, that uh, uh, little piece of truth. It's a very important piece of truth for us. It's about God's character and God's glory. That's what's at stake. So this blacksmith named John stands there with his hat in his hand and he says, God, I need you to fulfill your covenant. And God poured his power out. It was about God's character and God's glory. We need to remember that as we pray for our church as well. It's always about God. Not only is it humility and unity, the third word I want to give you this morning is the word clarity. And look back at your prayer for just a moment in verses 29 and 30. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, when you pray, if you want ground-shaking prayer, you need to be clear in your request to Almighty God. We always need to be clear in what we pray to God. Don't pray one of those universal prayers. You know, God bless all the preachers and missionaries and Sunday school teachers. Amen. Don't pray that way. Be clear when you pray. Choose and be specific as you pray for situations. And as we pray for our situation as a church, we need to be clear about what we're praying for exactly and precisely what we're praying for. But not only should we be clear, we need to be consistent with God's character as we pray. Have you ever felt like you're riding down the road and you have one of those moments where somebody whips in and cuts you off? You know, they do the famous stop at, red, stop at the corner at the red light and then turn. And they don't even touch their brake and they just keep going. You know what I mean. And you have to brake and you have to come to a good hard stop. Or, like the fellow that did me, I was not too far away from uh, the nails the other day, that three-way stop right there, and I came to a good stop, a full stop, a complete stop on the section that I was on, just to be sure, and here comes two young men in their car. The driver was looking down at his hand. I have a suspicion his thumbs were moving rapidly as he looked down at his hand. He never saw the stop sign. Not only did he never see the stop sign, but his car suddenly began to veer into my lane. And I said, well, this is interesting. This man's about to pop me. He's just about to bean me right now. And I really don't want his silver paint on my black car. Not at all. But I didn't swerve. I kept my course straight. I thought, I'm going to see what happens with this fellow. His passenger was getting a little wide-eyed, watching his friend run the stop sign and watching his friend as he's looking downward and he's not looking up. And at the last minute, the guy jerked his car to the side. Now, I've got to tell you what the carnal Kevin wanted to do. The carnal Kevin wanted to suddenly shoot up one of those prayers, kill him, God. <laughs> Just give him a flat tire right now. 
You need to, that God wouldn't have heard that prayer. He probably would have laughed at me and said, try again, boy. Listen to me. When we pray, we've got to be consistent with God's character. We have to, always. And when you look at the prayer that they have prayed here, really going all the way back into verse 25, and you look at this, 24 and 25, you're going to see three parts to the prayer. You're going to see that they worshipped God when they prayed. Now, sometimes you don't have time to worship God. Sometimes you just got to say, Lord, help, and now. Sometimes you have to do that. But when you're having your prayer time, and when we pray, and I try to lead lead us this way in our prayer meetings at church, I try to lead us where we have part of that time as a time of worship. Y'all who attend prayer meeting understand that and recognize that. Then there's the second part of this prayer, and that second part was warfare. They said, Lord, look on their threats. And grant to your servants with boldness they may speak your word. And this was a warfare prayer. There's a time you need to recognize that your difficulties are difficulties that God has placed in front of you. They're mountains that God has placed in front of you to strengthen you spiritually. But there's also a time you need to recognize that the mountain in front of you is a devilish mountain, not a divine mountain, and that you've got to stand against that de- that devilish mountain in the the name of Jesus and do warfare against what's in front of you in that very moment. You need to recognize the difference. One of the beautiful passages in Isaiah 49, I think it's verse 11. Don't hold me to the exact verse, but you can look it up and find it for yourself. God says he'll level out his mountains. I'll make all my mountains roads. You know, and you may get strengthened by that and you're praying about that, but then you recognize God levels that out and now that you're strengthened he carries you through and you've learned your lesson through that that God wanted to teach you to grow you spiritually in the case of these devilish mountains however God tells you to take charge and stand up and speak against what that is that has come against you in that moment and you speak against it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and that's what they did this was warfare but then they prayed to be able to work It wasn't just them working, they asked God to work. And you see, sometimes I think that's where we fall short. We want God to do all the work and us get all the glory. Oh wait, I didn't mean that. We want God to do all the work and us to get the benefits. Same difference actually, isn't it? God is not a drink machine that you go put 50 cents in and get your your soda out of, folks. And God wants to honor and God wants to glorify His name, but God intends for us to be involved in kingdom work. He says, Lord, Lord, grant that Your servants can speak with boldness. Lord, they said, if you stand up there again, you're going to be in trouble. So, Lord, we need a little bit of boldness right now to go back out there. Because I won't be honest with you, if someone came in here right now and said, you say one more word, I'm taking you to jail, I'm going to be honest with you. My next breath, my heart would go up a little bit as I said the next word. It would be a little nerve-wracking for me. I've got to tell you, it would not be as easy to speak the second time as it was the first time. You know what I'm saying? And these fellas had just come away from a council that they knew had the power to kill them. They had already crucified Jesus. And they knew that. And they said, so Lord, what are we going to do? We're going to move down to the next town and going to start there. No, sir. They said, Lord, we've got to get back out there, so give us the boldness to get back out there. But Lord, we need you to work too. We need you to show yourself strong and yourself mighty as well, Heavenly Father. So you stretch out your hand and you do, you do uh, uh, these things, these signs and these wonders and, and uh, these miracles. You do that, Heavenly Father, while we're doing uh, what we must do. Be consistent with God's character. And then thirdly, be confident, ladies and gentlemen. When you pray, pray with faith. When you pray, expect it to be done. 
When you pray, pray in Jesus' name and be confident as you pray. Let me give you another word quickly. And it's the word urgency. And you need to see this and understand this because it shows up twice in the passage of Scripture. Not the very word itself, but the concept of urgency. In verse 24, when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord. And then later in verse 29, Lord, look at their threats and grant to your servants this the boldness to speak your word with all boldness. Let me show you the, 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 the urgency of this. Let me show you their voices, first of all. And, and I, I need you to understand that there wasn't much dignified about what went on here when it said that they were together it, to, they spoke, raised their voice to God with one accord. They're talking about everybody who was present prayed all at one time. There was nothing dignified about their prayer meeting. Everybody was praying at the same time. You say, well, they weren't Baptists, were they? Well, uh, you know, it doesn't much matter because they were in touch with God, doesn't it? Isn't that true? And this is what we need to understand, ladies and gentlemen. You say, well, doesn't the Bible say do everything decently and in order? Yes, absolutely it does. But that's not talking about prayer meetings, ladies and gentlemen. It's not talking about getting in touch with God. And there are times, I promise you, if we were sitting here right now and the tornado sirens went off and somebody ran indoors and said, tornado's coming right now, and we heard it pulling the tiles off the roof up there, I promise you, ladies and gentlemen, you wouldn't care and wait for somebody else to pray. You'd pray at the same time that they did. You'd get rather urgent about your praying. And they all prayed at once. By the way, if you look at Hebrews 5, 7, just write that down in your margin uh, or, or somewhere else and look it up later because we don't have time now because the roast is burning or something like that. And, uh, but, but hear me well. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. Hear me. Jesus prayed with strong crying and tears when he prayed. And we're not better than Jesus. Hello? And then the verbs that are in this, in this passage. He says, look. Lord, look at what they've done. Lord, grant to your servants the boldness. Lord, stretch out your hand. Lord, do miracles. Let miracles be done. Let wonders be done. Do all of these things. He was very clear and they were very urgent for God to work. Now, I'm going to finish and I'm going to finish quickly, but I want you to hear me. There's one more word for you there that I want to give to you. And it's the word opportunity. The word opportunity. And opportunity says it all. Verse 31, when they prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the Word of God with boldness. The place was shaken, the people were filled, and the Word was preached, ladies and gentlemen. They took the opportunity and they went forward for the glory of Jesus Christ. They did not back up. They went forward. I want to tell you about David Green. David Green lived in Oklahoma. And in 1986, his modest business was collapsing. Not just his, but the oil industry in that part of Oklahoma was sinking. Everything was sinking. And they came to David and said, you're at the point of closing your doors of bankruptcy right now. And that's what they said to him. David Green went into his office and he crawled up under his desk in the little part where normally your legs would sit. And he crawled up under there and he began to pray. And he said, God, you are God. 
and only you can turn this thing around for me. And today you don't know David Green, and you've probably never met David Green, but let me tell you, you have gone to some of David Green's uh, stores before. One of them's right here in Hattiesburg. It's called Hobby Lobby. And in 2006 alone, they did $1.6 billion worth of business. But David Green said it didn't happen till I went to God and I asked God to take charge of my business and my finances. You see, God's in the business of glorifying His name. And God's in the business of turning things that look difficult into things that are delightful when His name is glorified with it. Not always. Not always. Sometimes you have disasters and all you can do is say, I don't know why it happened, but I trust God. This is going to, you know, God's going to get the glory from this. And you ache and have scars and wounds for a long, long time. And you'll find that in heaven. But even in that, God has gotten glory because you've shown yourself faithful to God. And that's what he wants to see with the 38th family today. A faithful church. A church that says, I'm not giving up. I'm not going to grouse. I'm not going to groan. I'm going to call out to God and give him the glory. That's what he's looking for. And that's where we are. And I don't know about your personal story and your personal walk. And I don't know some things about your life on a personal level except to say that I know who, I know who holds the keys for victory in your life and His name is Jesus Christ. And if you've never met Jesus today, you need to turn to Jesus. And you need to trust Jesus. And you need to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus. And if you don't know how, that's why we have men and women here that can take the Word of God and show you how you can be born again. Some of you, some of you are this far from God receiving glory in your life and it, it's all because He's told you that you should connect with Him here, that your membership should be here and you should be serving Him through this church and you just keep holding back and you don't want to do it. And... Um, God says, okay, I'm going to hold back too until you do, you know. And, and, and if he's spoken to you that way, you need to be clear and you need to be obedient in what he said to you. And you need to do that. And you will see that God will begin something ground-shaking in your life when you do. Father, um, I can only ask you to show yourself glorious in this invitation and touch lives and Heavenly Father if we've never done business now's the time for us to really do business and I ask you Heavenly Father to show yourself marvelous right now so I magnify your name and I ask you to take charge of this invitation it's yours it's yours Father touch lives and change lives in Jesus name Amen. The potter's hand. Stand to your feet. Let's do business with God. Take these steps. Make it a place of prayer. Call out to God. It's time for some ground-shaking prayer, ladies and gentlemen. Come on, let's do it. Beautiful Lord, wonderful Savior, I know for sure. All of my days are held in your hand. Lord.
Amen and amen. amen. Thank you for your patience this morning. This has been in some ways a solemn assembly and we understand that but I've checked in and Jesus still sits on his throne amen. and he's still Lord. Amen. Yes indeed. Tonight, tonight, tonight I'm preaching a portrait of persecution and um, we all have watched the news about some who made news recently and I'll be mentioning one of them, Yusef Narakani, I can't even pronounce it right, um, tonight and um, I never did learn Farsi, sorry. And, and uh, so you come tonight and listen to the Word of God as we um, preach this last of the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. Other words? Join hands across the aisle and we're going to close out with all hail King Jesus. I want to see visitors. Pastor, if you're a visitor and hadn't been this way before, come speak with a preacher after the service.